So here we go. Um, let's start uh, first off. Um, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I don't know if you want to look at me. Uh, my subsequent videos may or may not have my face here, but um, I wanted to make sure you guys saw me at least once. Um, so this is new for all of us. Um, it's going to be a little different, but I promise that um, I will alter uh, my presentations and what we need to know to, to get you through this class. Um, we'll focus on the basics for these units and um, I won't put you through the ringer too badly. I know you have a lot to do and probably have a lot on your mind. Um, but we're going to talk about um, our units. This unit will be moral development, a little bit with developmental psychology, and, and we're going to shorten the units up a little bit. We have this unit and memory. Um, I think both of them will be um, interesting to you, and we'll finish up with relationship development. So um, I'm making these on the fly, and I'm putting together pretty quickly. I, I typically don't have videos for adolescent psychology class, as you guys know. So um, I do it. I've done it regularly for AP Psych, a little bit more polished, perhaps. But um, let's see how we go, and, and you guys can comment along the way and, and let me know what you think. Um, I miss you guys. Um, you give me energy and. And purpose. So um, things are a little different right now, and, and I hope I wish you guys health and good mental health. And um, I'm always available by email. So uh, keep me posted if you need to on what's going on. So we'll get started. You should have your packet um, out with you, and the numbers are a little screwy on the packet, but we're going to be focusing on page three and four for the most part right now. If you don't have a packet, um, you could do uh, a split screen or print a packet out at home. You don't have to do the whole packet. Um, the packet is on Canvas, so um, do keep that in mind. So we're going to start with developmental psychology, moral development, and we're going to focus on a couple of concepts today in this short video. Um, those two concepts are... Um, Equality and equity, terms I think you've probably heard of before and probably have a pretty good idea of what they mean, um, but we're going to talk about it from the perspective of our unit and um, we're going to talk about a, a psychologist named Kohlberg, Lawrence Kohlberg, and he's kind of the biggie when it comes to talking about developmental morality. How does morality develop in people? And... Um, we'll take a look at his theory and a little bit about him and uh, a little bit about one of his colleagues who disagreed with him a little bit. So for Kohlberg, morality, when we say the word morality, remember we want to operationalize it just like we operationalized the term sports earlier in the semester. But for Kohlberg, it was a pretty simple term. Morality referred to um, a sense of right and wrong or a sub acceptable conduct. So when you have a choice to make, if there is an option that I can do the right thing or I can do the wrong thing, um, then it is a moral decision. Uh, not all of our decisions are moral decisions, by the way. Um, but if you you can do something or you can choose to do something else or to not do something and it, it might be better for you or for other people, then it'd be, it's probably a moral decision. So we're going to look at the stages of conduct. Um, think of it as a scale, the right and wrong scale, the scales of justice, perhaps, you could also think of. And we'll take a look at equality first, and this is basically deals with sameness. The same treatment for all people involved, um, regardless of fairness or justice. So sameness, the same treatment. Everybody gets one packet at the beginning of a unit. That is equality, and everybody is expected to do the same. Um, in that packet. Um, equality can be a very good thing. Um, I usually have a, you know, a discussion with this. Is equality always the best thing? And always is probably the key term there, right? Speaking in absolutes is not necessarily the best thing to do in, in many cases. Um, so equality is a good thing. 
um, under most circumstances, right? If we all bring in, if we bring in treats and we only have 30 cookies and we have 30 people in class, then equality is probably okay. Um, if I have 30 packets, um, then everybody should probably get a packet. Um, but it's not always the best. So when we think about distributing things, um, everybody gets one AP Psych t-shirt, for example. Um, everybody gets one pencil or, or gets two pencils for the a, um, ACT test. Equality of rights might be a little different thing, right? Um, rights um, to participate in sports, the rights to select the classes that you might be interested in to take. So, I mean, our, it seems like our laws are based on equality. Everybody's treated equal, but I think we might see that it might not be okay to treat somebody who is a convicted felon and maybe they're convicted of murder. Um, we might not treat them equally, uh, that we might treat somebody else who has not committed a crime. We might treat people differently under certain circumstances. So equality might not always be the best, but typically in simple terms, equality is a pretty good thing. Uh, now when it comes to equity, um, we have a little diagram over here and it, it says, um, Equity might be more fair in some circumstances. And on the bottom, this might be hard to see, but it says equality is about sameness. And that's the, the three people on the left. If we have a high bar to be successful, um, and if everybody gets exactly the same, that, that success bar might be out of reach for some people. Some people might be born with um, issues, whether it's poverty or learning disabilities or physical disabilities where they might have the same opportunity as, as another person, but they're, they're already um, behind in their ability to, to achieve. In that case, maybe equity might be a better solution in this case. Um, everybody has a chance to succeed, um, but some people might get something different that will un that will help them have an opportunity to be successful. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Equity is a difficult concept for people to understand, adults included, um, whether they be um, teachers or doctors and lawyers or um, truck drivers or um, delivery people. E equity is less understood. And once we start to say some people are going to get some things or some distribution of goods or rights that others don't, then it's it's automatically not good. So be careful with this one. This is a higher level term to understand. But equity recognizes that sometimes fairness demands unequal treatment or distribution of rights. So um, in school, for example, somebody who has dyslexia uh, might get extra test time on the ACT test. Now that is not equal. Um, if it's a 40 minute reading test and somebody gets 60 minutes, that's an inequality. But we might understand that it's more fair because in order for them to be successful, they have to have adjustments in the conditions. So equity involves dissimilar treatment and sometimes people notice that dissimilar treatment and they don't like it and they're not willing to except that um, fairness might be better than equality in this case. And a, a little bit more complex description is when human rights are abridged or when human rights have been diminished or reduced in the past. So people's rights have been restricted because of their um, sexual orientation, um, their biological sex, um, their their socioeconomic status, because of laws, past laws that were unjust, or because of insensitivity, then equity suggests that we must treat people um, unfairly and catch those people up who've lost their rights in the past in order to bring them up to equality today. So um, we'll talk about that uh, in the next slide, but 
Um, I like this little diagram. It's pretty simple, but um, we see the person over here has more than they need to be successful. So in this case, they don't need whatever this is here, whether it be money or um, government assistance somehow or educational assistance. If we take some of that and give a little bit extra over here, then all people can be successful. And, and probably as a society, we'd be better off because this person here is making it on their own now. Um, but as we move along, um, just think of the word fair. Uh, and I know it's difficult, but think of how fairness works here. Equity is sometimes referred to as fairness. So um, if we, as a government or as a society, are trying to make up for past injustices because of racial inequality, um, sexual orientation inequality, um, biological sex inequality, um, then we can justify unequal treatment in order to catch those people who in the past were mistreated um, or had um, problems. Um, with fairness, we can catch them up and give them extra until they catch up. Title IX is an example of that, uh, and I know some of you might not know what Title IX is, but um, in the 70s, early 1970s, the opportunities for biological female athletes in high schools and colleges was not equal to that of males, even though females made up 50% of the student population, paid 50% of the tuition, they had um, less than a quarter of the opportunities in most cases. And the court said, well, female extracurricular opportunities are just as important for as, as biological male opportunities. So Title IX was passed, and what that meant was if a high school or a, co a public college or university did not have equal opportunities and extracurriculars for male students and female students, then that school had a responsibility to spend more money and create more opportunities for the female students or student athletes, which meant then that since money is not unlimited, um, some of that money came from already existing male athletic programs, which made a lot of people really angry if they were in those programs. Um, and I, I think the disappointment is justified, right? At the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, in the early 90s, when I was actually coaching varsity baseball here at Verona, the university quit um, or suspended baseball uh, at the Big Ten level, varsity baseball. And that money went into other female sport opportunities like softball. And schools were required to do that until there was a, about a 50% opportunities, 50-50 of all the opportunities for extracurriculars between males and females, 50% had to be for female students and 50% for male students. Now, um, football prevents a, an exact 50-50 participation numbers, but it's not just in numbers of athletes, it's in numbers of sport opportunities or extracurricular opportunities. So um, do keep that in mind. When I was in high school, um, there were less female athletic opportunities for female students than there were for male students. And that has changed a lot. And um, if you can look at the numbers here in the early 70s, there were only about 300,000 females in the whole nation in high school sports. And in the um, 40 years or so since then, um, there's 3.2 million female students competing now. And, and that statistic is old by today's standards. Seven years later, I think it's somewhere around 4 million, if I remember um, some statistics I've seen recently. So um, there are more male athletes, and that largely is predominantly because of football because they need so many bodies there. But this was not an equality situation for a long time because they were cutting funding from male student sports to fund female student sports. So they were spending more money on female sports, and a lot of people complained about that because it wasn't being equal, even though for 100 years of 
high school sports previous, maybe a, a quarter or not even that was spent on female sports. So, um, we'll, we'll do a little practice with that, um, in our next video. So, uh, we're going to also do a sh real short discussion here about stage theory basics. So we move from equality and equity. How do stage theories work in psychology? I just want to give you a little background. And this is on page four uh, of your packet, the top half of page four. So you can follow along there. Um, all stage theories work the same. So we're going to, we're talking about moral stages. There are also stage theories for, um, social development and cognitive development and other stage theories, but they all work the same basically. Um, one of those rules is everybody goes through the stages in the same order, regardless of how many stages there are. Think of the stages as stepping stones. Um, we might not all get to the top, but we have to go through in the same order. We all start at the bottom here and then we move up to the top. Um, stage theories also suggest that People may go through stages at different rates. So some of us may bump up quicker up those stages than others and get stuck, get stuck there, while others are slower but may pass us up. So some people are quick, some people are slow. There are average um, times and stages. And remember, most people don't get through all stages, especially when it comes to moral development. Um, and we don't all... Um, move for the same reasons and our inability to move through stages depends on a lot of factors not just our own thinking but also society and environment so the roadrunner may get through those stages real quick and the coyote might get through a few of them and fall off like he falls off the cliff all the time if you remember looney tunes and stage hopping is rare and stage hopping basically means that if you start at stage one, you don't go to stage four without spending some time in stage two and three. You have to develop, and in each stage, you develop different skills, okay? Um, yeah, and there's our bunny hopping. Uh, and I, we'll, we'll misuse this term quite a bit, but we're not typically in a stage. We just display types of behaviors and thinking patterns, and those patterns get collectively called a stage. Um, and a stage is just basically a description of behaviors that we normally exhibit. So we're not in a stage, but they may use stage descriptions to explain why we do something or why we don't do something. Um, and remember the stages, they're just labels. They're a social construct. The behaviors and thinking patterns have been around for thousands and thousands of years. Kohlberg was just one of the first ones to actually scientifically put the stages into a predictable description. I mean, Socrates, Plato, philosophers for thousands of years have been talking about ethics and morality. Kohlberg was one of the first ones to actually test it um, and write about it. So why was he interested in morality? Um, we're going to save that for the next video. So um, your task, and I'll put this on Canvas, um, on the front page of your packet, you have some dilemmas. You're going to read question two on the front page. It's a story about two boys named Timmy and Jimmy. And you're just going to respond and answer the two questions that follow. The question is, um, would you treat the boys equally? Um, and what should be done to the boys and why? And then one extra part underneath question number two here is, is your answer based on equality or equity? That's it. Um, so good luck, and um, hopefully this works out. Well, let's be patient with each other. Um, I'll get this on Canvas, and um, you should, um, and I'll send out an email to everybody, but you should look at the lesson plans on Canvas, and then there's going to be a link um, in Canvas that you can look at every day. It'll be um, read this first um, up on Canvas and you can go there and see what the um, the I can statements are or um, what we hope you accomplish. So thanks for your patience and I hope you're doing well and um, we'll talk soon.